I want to encourage everybody else to be turning to John chapter 19. We're going to be picking up in verse 28 this morning, and we will be finishing John chapter 19. We're going to finish the scene of the cross and take us all the way to the tomb and the burial of Jesus this morning. I want to say a couple things before I begin. Number one, so encouraged this week by the number of texts and emails and phone calls I got for those of you who were following up with the homework I gave you this week. Uh, just encouraging to me to know how much time you're spending in the scriptures throughout the week, and I hope that was meaningful and beneficial to you. Hope you grew in your faith because of it. I do want to encourage you to just get in the habit, if you don't already, of bringing some kind of journal with you on Sunday mornings. Uh, this morning, we're going to be covering a lot of scripture, and I know I can get excited and talk a little fast sometimes. So um, as I do that, jot down the scriptures. You have time to revisit them during the week. And if I talk too fast and you get overwhelmed, uh, please don't worry. Shoot an email to uh, Alicia at the church office this week. I'm going to give her a copy of my slide deck, and she can forward that to you, and so you'll have all the scriptures that we talked about. Um, I just think it's important to revisit this throughout the week, the things that we talk about together, and I know you'll grow because of it. Uh, a couple other things quickly. Number one, as Michael already pointed out, I hope you'll take advantage of our Connect booth. We'll have either an elder or a deacon there every Sunday, a way for you to ask questions or get better connected. Uh, for those of you who are newer with the congregation, and one of the best ways to get connected is through the online directory that we have, which is app-based. And so if you would like to do that, there's some pictures on there. You can help figure out who the people are that you're talking to every week. It is really a helpful tool. If you want more information about that, stop at the Connect booth on the way out today and, and ask for some help with that. And if you haven't already downloaded the church app, but you need help with that, please stop and, and do that as well. So one last thing. If you'll notice on your way out today, on the left-hand side by the main doors is a colorful display that says, Go and Make Disciples. And at the bottom of that display are little card holders that have these little cards in them. They just say, You're Invited. And on the back is says Mission Viejo Church of Christ with a QR code. This is an easy way for you to have some of these in your purse or your wallet or your pocket or your car or your man bag, or your giant hat, whatever it is that you carry important things in, keep some of these handy so that as you encounter people during the week and you'd like to invite them, this is a great way just to hand them a card and do that. So please take advantage of that. Those are for your use. They're on the left-hand side as you walk out today. As we get into our lesson this morning, I encourage you to follow along. We are at a point in the scriptures here where everything falls into place. Everything we have been talking about through months and months of study in the Gospel of John is now falling into place as God's will comes to fruition through the body of Jesus of Nazareth on that cross on Golgotha all those years ago. And I want us to think about not just the death of this man on the cross, but the deeper meaning behind all of the symbolism that John shares with us in these verses today. And so I hope you'll follow along. We'll pick up here in John chapter 19 and uh, starting in verse 28. I've got the wrong scripture on this first slide. I apologize. Starting in verse 28 of John chapter 19. It says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now let me pause just a second. These are the two things that we highlighted in our lesson last week, and I asked you to think more deeply about what John is trying to get us to think more deeply about as he narrates this crucifixion for us. Number one, that everything was coming to completion, that God's will was being done through Jesus. He is dying like a common criminal, but this is not the death of just another common criminal. God is doing something, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But second is that scripture was being fulfilled. What God was doing through Jesus is unfolding exactly as God had said it would unfold. And that's why I asked you to spend time this week in the 22nd Psalm, comparing them to the crucifixion accounts in all four Gospels. Because you see in that passage what God had in mind is exactly what is happening in the body of Jesus as it hangs on that cross. So John reminds us of that again. Knowing that everything had now been finished and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now what's going to happen here as we walk through some of this this morning is I'm going to ask you to think about these things in two ways. Number one, just these are things that happen to a person as they're dying. This is describing the physical death of Jesus the Christ. And these are things that he's saying and things that he's experiencing as any human would in that moment as they're dying. 
But as John does so often in his gospel, he's taking these things and he's layering them with meaning. And so I'm going to ask you to think more deeply about the meaning behind these things that he's saying. He's thirsty, obviously, because he's been tortured, he's been beaten, he's been humiliated, he's hanging on a cross. He is physically thirsty, but is there something else to what he's saying? And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. As we think about this idea of thirsting, of course Jesus is physically thirsty, but is there more to that statement? I would draw your mind back to a couple different psalms. This one you're familiar with because we sing this in song form a lot. Psalm 42, the first two verses, David writes, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you or thirsts after you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? There's this idea of this hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus talks about that, right? Here he is on the cross and he's physically thirsty, but he's also thirsting after something else. What could that be? intimacy with God. In Psalm 63 and verse 1, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. You can't drink God in a cup of water, but what is he talking about? This intimate, real desire he has for relationship with his Father. I thirst after that meaningful relationship with you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. To desire God the way that you desire water when you've run out of water. You know what it's like to be thirsty. Do you know what it's like to be thirsty for a relationship with your creator? In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus reminds his disciples after they have encouraged him to have something to eat. He says, I already have food that you don't know about. And of course, they're totally confused. You know, where did he pack these snacks that we can't see? But his response is, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And I would suggest to you that when Jesus is crying out, I'm thirsty, it's more than just I'm parched. It's that I am thirsty to do the will of my Father in this moment, as he has been throughout his entire ministry. In John chapter 18 and verse 11, Peter, thinking he's doing the right thing, you remember this from a few weeks ago, pulls out a sword and does what? Strikes off the ear of the high priest's servant. He's ready to go to war for his Savior. But what's Jesus' response? He commands Peter, put your sword away because shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And of course, what is that a reference to? What he would endure on that cross. And so I want you to think about this. There's this, this way in which John is just describing a thirsty man who's about to die. But there's this other way that he's inviting us to think about what Jesus is truly experiencing on that cross. His body is thirsty, but his soul is longing to do the will of his Father. He is drinking the cup the Father gave him in that moment. Of course, there's sad irony in this scene as it unfolds, if you're willing to think about it. Jesus, the one who had promised to provide water. Think about his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. Think about John chapter 7 as he stands up on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles and talks about people who are thirsty, coming to him for a drink. This Jesus who offered to quench the world's thirst on that cross is now asking for a drink. This Jesus, the one who had turned water, very first sign that he performs in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, what was it? He turned water into what? Wine, and not just any old wine, good wine. This same Jesus who turned all of the 120 gallons of water into good wine is now given what? Sour wine to drink. There is sad irony in this, and it just illustrates what Jesus is enduring on that cross, if we're willing to think about it. Speaking of wine, what about this wine vinegar? Why did they give him wine vinegar on a sponge to drink? That's an odd thing to offer someone could be that there were some properties within that wine that might have dulled the pain that he was feeling. I'll, although I don't know what you could give a crucified man to help suffer what he's enduring in that moment. But again, there's something more here. 
If you look at Psalm 19, verses 19 through 21, you know how I am scorned. Remember, John tells this happened to fulfill Scripture. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed, David writes in the 19th Psalm. Again, another Psalm like 22 that's filled with messianic hope and promise. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food, and they gave me vinegar for my thirst. And so, yes, Scripture is fulfilled in what Jesus is doing here. But what about this plant, this hyssop plant? Is there any significance to that, that they offered him the wine on the branch of a hyssop plant? And I want to suggest something to you. If you go back to Exodus chapter 12, as Moses is giving the children of Israel directions from God regarding how they are to observe the Passover. And we've talked at length about the connection between Jesus and the Passover. You remember what John said in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We talked about how John is making connections between when Jesus is crucified and the time when they would have been slaughtering the Passover lambs. But listen to this. This is the instruction. Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. You know what they were asked to do to smear the blood on the doorposts and thus the angel would pass over them. This is the Passover story. But it's hyssop that they used to spread that blood on the door frame. One more connection between Jesus and the sacrificial lambs of the Passover. And then Jesus says this, it is finished. And again, this could just be the words of a man who's about to breathe his last. Final words. But of course, in this case, there's so much more to it, isn't there? What does it mean when he says, it is finished? Look at John chapter 5 and verse 36. Jesus says, in this context, he is listing off those things that would serve as witnesses to the claims he's making about himself. And he talks about John the Baptist. Remember how John told you who I am. But he goes on, he says, I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me, listen to what he says, to finish. The very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. We've talked about this from the very beginning. Jesus came with a purpose. And what was the purpose? To do the will of the Father who sent him. Everything he did was to accomplish the will of of the Father. He talks about it from the beginning of his ministry to the very end. When he says it is finished, this is what he's articulating on the cross, that I have accomplished what my Father sent me to accomplish. Listen to John chapter 17, if you recall, just a few weeks ago, that final prayer he gives in the garden. As he begins to pray, he says, Father, the hour has come. He knows what he's about to endure. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. We talked about how the crucifixion is actually an act of glorification. That the son and the father are glorified through this heinous act. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life. To, <clears throat> excuse me, to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. No one in the history of the world before and no one after has had such a sense of purpose as Jesus of Nazareth. He knew what he came for. He knew what he was being asked to do. And he was laser focused on that task. And as he prepares himself through prayer for what he's about to endure, he asks God to help him in that effect. I have come to do your will. I've come to finish the work that you've given me to do. And as he's making that last statement, according to John's gospel, it's the last thing he said before he gave up his spirit and died. <clears throat> it is finished. He's not talking about his life. He's talking about the work that he is completing on the cross. And that is so important for us to think about what exactly was God doing through the body of Jesus on the cross. God's will is being completed 
The task Jesus was given is being finished, but why? Why that and what was God doing exactly through the body of Jesus? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is Jesus' act of obedience to the will of the Father. So I want to spend a few minutes this morning, and this is where you might want to start taking some notes. How do we understand the will of God as it is played out through the cross? Sometime when we get more time, we'll talk more in depth about what we call atonement theory. How do we as Christians best articulate what God was accomplishing through Jesus on the cross? And there's a lot to be said about that. And throughout history, Christians have talked about that and argued about that and tried to come up with the best way to articulate that. But for us today, how do we do that? <clears throat> Thank you very much. How do we do that? And so what I want to do this morning is instead of taking a deep dive into atonement theory, I just want to survey some scriptures for you. What does the Bible actually say? As the New Testament authors are reflecting on the death of Jesus, what is it that they say that God was doing through Jesus? And so I know this is totally unfair, but I'm going to do a shotgun approach towards this, and we're going to go through these as quickly as I can for time's sake, because I just want you to write them down and revisit them throughout the week. So here's some of the things that Scripture says about what God was doing through Jesus on the cross. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, and you'll notice not everything today comes from Paul's epistles, but Paul had a lot to say about this. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Why did he die on the cross? For our sins? To what effect? For our, what does he say? Justification. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Since we have now been justified by his blood. There's that word again, justification. How? By his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. What does the death of Jesus do? Reconciles us back to God, from enemies to friends. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this, but also we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Redemption, reconciliation, justification. I know these are big, heavy, churchy words, but this is what God is doing through Jesus on the cross. Pay attention to what these scriptures are saying. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. In him, who's the him? Jesus. In him we have redemption. How? Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. In accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. What is God doing through the Son on the cross? Making everything right again. And nothing short of that. Same book, Ephesians, this time chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. For he, Jesus, himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. What two groups is he talking about? He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. These two groups of people who would have never come together on their own. He says, he's made those two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting it aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. What is God doing through Jesus on the cross? Creating a new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Colossians chapter 1, Paul again. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Think about that and the breadth of the redeeming work of God. Not to reconcile humanity alone, all things, he says, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Everything that went wrong in the garden is being made right through the body of Jesus on the cross. Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. 
He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. All of those charges against us, all of that sin that condemns us and separates from us from our God was nailed to the cross with Jesus. And having disarmed, here we go again. What is the breadth of the redeeming work of God? To what length does it extend? Listen to what he says. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The redeeming work of God is so much bigger than we give it credit for sometimes. Since the children, this is Hebrews chapter 2 now. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's us. He's talking about creation, humanity. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, listen to this one, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. What did Jesus do on the cross? Set us free from the slavery of death and took away the power the devil has over us. For surely it is not angels he helps but Abraham's descendants. We don't have to live in fear of death anymore because of what God did through Jesus on the cross. Hebrews chapter 9, in the context here, Paul, or excuse me, the Hebrew author is talking about Jesus fulfilling the role of high priest and how the high priest has to enter into the holy of holies to make atonement for the sins of the people. In what way did Jesus do that? He says he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but... He entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we might do what? Serve the living God. This is what God is doing through the body of Jesus on that cross. And one more. And please understand, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a brief survey. Hopefully to make you want to dig deeper. 1 Peter 2, 2, chapter, sorry, 1 Peter 2, verses 23 through 25. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself, and here's what Peter does. He strings together this series of quotations from Isaiah 53. We've talked about that passage, right? The suffering servant passage, the one that Philip used to preach Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, that passage. All of these quotations come from that. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. That's just a a brief survey of all the ways that Scripture tells us God was at work through the body of Jesus on the cross. So when he says, it is finished, he means all of that. And more. It is finished. Not just, I'm about to die. I have done what the Father sent me to do. I have accomplished His will. And God's redeeming work is done. It is finished. The promise God first made to Adam and Eve when they were removed from the garden, that one day all of this will be sorted. That promise has come to fruition through the body of Jesus on the cross. That's what He means when He says, it is finished. What are the implications of that? We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But for now, let's go back to the text. So we're in John. John continues. He says, Now it was the day of preparation. And on the next day, there was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus. And then those of the other. What's going on here? Well, there's a law we find in Deuteronomy chapter 21, and the law says this, 
If someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, the NIV has, or tree, other translations have, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole or the tree overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So the Jewish authorities are mindful of that particular law. And so they need those bodies to be dealt with before the sun goes down. And so they ask Pilate to have the legs of the criminals broken. Can you imagine why? Because as they're hung on that cross, the only way to breathe is to push up with your feet. With a spike driven through your feet. If you break the femurs of the people on the cross, they can't push up anymore. And it speeds up the whole process. And the suffocation happens more quickly. So this is what they're asking Pilate to do. Can you speed up the process so that we can fulfill our law? But what happens is they go and they break the laws of the man on one side of Jesus. Then they break the legs of the man on the other side of Jesus. But then they get to Jesus. What does it say? When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And the man who saw it has given testimony. And his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. And here again, John is stressing the importance of the eyewitness nature of these accounts. But like we started the lesson talking about here again, just a description of a man dying, but so much more. Think with me about a couple of these elements here. Number one, the idea here that as the soldier pierced his side, blood and water come rushing out. Again, John is establishing that Jesus really was dead, but something more is at work here. In John chapter 6, you remember what Jesus said to the crowd? Got some of them so confused, they ended up leaving. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. This blood issuing out of the body of Jesus is his gift to the world. Yes, it's a sign that he really has died, but it's also the very thing he came to offer to the world because the blood of bulls and goats could not do what the blood of the Son of God could, which is take away sin forever. And in that moment, we see that blood issuing out of the side of Jesus, a gift to the world. But what about the water? I already mentioned it, but let me read it for you. In John 7, verses 37 through 39, on the last and greatest day of the festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. When Jesus said, It is finished, John records for us that he did what? He gave up his spirit and died. And here in this moment, we see this water issuing forth out of the side of Jesus, representative of that life-giving spirit that Jesus came to give to the world. Yes, it's a man physically dying, but in that death, Jesus is giving the two greatest gifts ever given to humanity, the gift of his blood and the gift of his spirit. And I wonder how much of this is playing through John's mind as he stands at the foot of the cross and watches this man he loves so much die in this manner. John continues, he says, These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and, as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. So still concerned about the fulfillment of scripture, John mentions two more. Not one of his bones will be broken. They broke the legs of the other two, but not Jesus. And another scripture says they will look on the one whom they have pierced pierced. Psalm 34, verses 19 through 20. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, and not one of them will be broken. I think this is a scripture John has in mind when he quotes that, but 
there's even more at work here. Remember all this talk about the Passover lamb. Go back to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46. Part of the instruction about the lamb is this. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house and do not break any of the bones. Jesus' body has been prepared exactly as a Passover lamb would have been. And John does not want that to escape our notice. This is the will of God. And then the second passage that he quotes from is Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one that they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. In Luke's account of the gospel, he adds a detail that John doesn't, which is that as Jesus died, a Roman centurion considered everything he just saw, and he said, surely this man was innocent. And as the crowd started to disperse after having cheered on the death of Jesus and watched all of this take place, they walked away mournful, beating their chests. I think they instantly realized the weight of what had just transpired and the role that they had played in all of it. And so one last passage here. Jesus is dead. What do they do with the corpse? Something remarkable transpires, actually. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus from John chapter 3? Haven't heard from him in a while. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, 75 pounds worth. This is a proper Jewish burial. And a remarkable one at that. You know what would often happen time, oftentimes happen to the bodies on the cross? They would be left there for the birds of prey to pick at and consume. But Pilate gives them the body of Jesus. And they're able to prepare his body according to Jewish customs. And really, in a remarkable way, 75 pounds of expensive perfumes to anoint his body. And what's more, instead of just throwing the body in a common grave as would often happen, where is Jesus buried? It says, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen, and this was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus' body there. Just as Isaiah 53 tells us, in his death he would be buried with the wealthy. This is not the burial of a common criminal. Even in his burial... God is doing something special. So that's the story. That's the story as it's recorded for us in Scripture of how the Son of God died on the cross. But what are the implications of all of that? Going back to those passages that we surveyed so quickly, what are the implications of what God was doing through Jesus on that cross? And if you think critically about those passages we read together, you understand that the implications are enormous. The implications are eternal. The implications extend even beyond the realm that we see in front of us. There are spiritual implications to the death of Jesus. There is no boundary to the extent to which the blood of Jesus impacts God's creation. And it can be overwhelming to think about all that. But for us, as disciples here in this room this morning, the most important implication for us right here in this moment is that there are personal implications. That Jesus' death means something for me and to me. And I don't think anyone has ever articulated that more powerfully than the Apostle Paul when he says this in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. You probably know it. This is another one we sing a lot. I have been crucified with Christ. How could Paul say that? I have been crucified with Christ. Well, if you think back to Romans chapter 6, what does Paul tell us? That when we are buried 
with Jesus in baptism, we are what? Buried with him through baptism into death. We join him in his death and also his resurrection, but we are crucified with Christ. This meant something to Paul. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, listen, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is the death of Jesus personal to Paul? Yes. Does Paul understand the wide-reaching implications of the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross? Does he understand that it's about more than just him? Of course he does. But in his discipleship, this was everything. This is where Paul found his identity, is in the crucifixion of Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We can say confidently Jesus died for the sins of the world, but it's just as appropriate to say Jesus died for me. And when you say that, it means something. What does it mean? It means that we get to do what Paul did. We get to live by faith. And if I can just be bluntly honest with you for a moment, in almost 25 years of ministry, this is the thing that I want people to see more than anything, is what it looks like to live by faith. What it looks like to be freed from the way that humanity typically spends their lives. To live by faith is a blessing. And it's something that we don't take enough time to put into practice or to even think about deeply. What it looks like to live by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, Paul says simply, we live by faith and not by sight. Here's a, a practical way for me to try to illustrate this to you. We are coming up on another election cycle. Hooray! We're about to spend the next few months with two different political parties doing everything they can to convince us that if we don't pledge our allegiance to their platform and their policies and their person, that all will be lost. This is the way elections are framed now. Pay attention. Vote for our guy or everything will be lost. You've heard the message. And if we walk by sight, that's what we see every day in front of us. If we walk by sight, we leave this building today and the immediacy of the troubles the world presents us, they're always right in front of us and we cannot see past it. And so we walk around anxious, nervous, worried, fretting disciples. Is that what Jesus has in mind for us? Is that what he's called us to? No. And so what do we do? What we do, family, is we embrace a different way to see the world around us. We walk out of these doors today, and instead of worrying about what's in front of us, we see beyond that to something eternal. And we choose to walk by faith. What does it look like to have your vision changed? Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches a fiery sermon, and they thank him by stoning him to death. And as he is being stoned to death, Stephen lives his last few moments not by sight, but by faith. And that faith opens up a portal into heaven for him. And the veil is pulled back, and he sees something that we can all see if we would only pay attention. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, where was he? Standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, to those who were killing him. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. When we leave this building this morning and go back into that world, I invite you to pause and look up to the heavens and see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God and I want you to walk by faith this week. Because faith 
is our victory. And God has made us victorious people. Won't you walk by faith with me this week? We serve a risen Savior. This is the end of the story of the cross. But is this the end of the story? No. Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches that crowd. He reminds them of King David. He says, I can confidently say to you that David was, was killed and was buried. And he says to that audience back then, and if you want to, you can go visit his tomb today. Wouldn't do us any good to visit the tomb of Jesus today, would it? Because he's not there. Where is he? He's at the right hand of the Father and High, ruling over all creation. And if you can't see that, then you are still blind. Won't you walk by faith this week? I want to invite you at this point in time to get up and find a table closest to you as we do something special together as the Lord's people, something we do every week. We're going to do it a little differently this morning. There are tables scattered around the auditorium, whichever one's closest to you. If you're not able to to do that, just raise your hand and one of our men in the back will come and, and bring you the Lord's Supper. The elements are there on the table. I invite you to grab one. Gather around wherever works for you. As you're getting together, I would like to remind you of a passage in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is giving instruction about partaking the Lord's Supper together. And in this passage is something that I think we ought to dwell on more. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says this in verse 23. He says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then Paul offers this commentary. He says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And with that in mind, thinking about everything we've talked about in the Gospel of John over the last few months, thinking about just the last few weeks focused in on the crucifixion itself. What does it mean for us to proclaim the death of Jesus to the world? It means that we are boldly proclaiming the work of God finished on the cross. That God's redeeming work was carried out in that broken body on the cross. That's what it means. And there's a lot of different ways that we can do that, but today I want to invite you to do it in one of our favorite ways, which is through a song. And so... I'm going to ask uh, Priyanka, could you pull that song up for us? We're going to sing one more song. Some of the songs that Josh selected today helped us walk through the crucifixion scene. But this one does so, so powerfully. Man of the sorrows, Lord, I for the Son of God who came, Oh, uh-huh. 